Six years after Tim Gurner suggested that millennials save for a house down payment by skipping on avocado toast, younger generations are sparking new fear in businessmen, politicians, and journalists alike. Somehow, the young refuse to become more conservative with age, or so we are told. Yet, despite new wave of journalist clickbait panic, capitalism is the main and only mode of production and exchange. And, unlike the banking account of an average millennial, capitalism has been doing great. Global GDP is growing, so is population size, access to electricity and internet. Energy and fuel consumption are rising, and with them inevitably are global standard of living and average yearly temperature. So, by all reasonable means, Capitalism is nowhere close to being killed by millennials or anyone else, being the main socioeconomic model. Late-stage capitalism has been shaping our world, from new wave of imperial wars to the return of neon turtlenecks into fashion. In this video, we will explore how officially middle-aged millennials and actual young people have been coping with the neoliberal reign. How many red pills does it take for a 40-year-old to deal with the fast-approaching midlife crisis? Which meditation course is the best to manifest your own capitalist heaven? Will the warrior pose help you accept the commodification of your body? We will look at this and many other questions that will help you find your identity in the hellscape of post-postmodernism. I want you to take a few moments and allow yourself to visualize and feel exactly how it would be if you already had all the money you could ever need, just as if it was an unlimited resource. For years now, I've been wondering why modern cultural movements, yet so different, share very similar underlying ideas. It is no secret to anyone that young men can travel from self-improvement to hustle culture to darkest depths of the manosphere in under a year. Younger women, on the other hand, travel between beauty and wellness, as well as manifestation and QAnon conspiracies just as easily. All while non-binaries are screaming in horror and Generation Alpha is making itself known on the internet with poop jokes. But what informs these connections between seemingly different subcultures? Let's address a four-decade-old question first. What are millennials? Hey, Gen Z, you can suck it. And well, here I will have to tell you that it sort of doesn't matter for this video. Actual Western millennials who are usually associated with this title are now approaching their 40s. Yet, they are still treated by conservative media and often by themselves too, as if they are 13-year-olds. So really, what millennials are makes little to no difference at this point. In this video, we'll talk about cultural imprint of everyone who was born after the fall of Berlin Wall, in the world where neoliberal capitalism defines culture. So, why base cultural analysis solely on neoliberal capitalism? You can certainly choose a different frame of analysis to go ahead, but what can be more exciting than reducing overly complex topic to a two-dimensional square plane? There are two main ideas that I use in this video to analyze younger people's relationship with culture. First is hyperconsumerism, and second is neoliberal individualism. By its own nature, a capitalist market tends to turn objects and experiences into commodities that are bought and sold. New World provides us comfort of next-day Amazon deliveries, but on the other side, it slips away our humanity, as our interests and bodies slowly become subscription services. Neoliberal concentration on individualism is one of the main ideas that shaped culture around the world since the 70s, and consumption is the main tool that we use to form and express our identities. Not bad. Not bad at all. Back in 2017, Stephen Metcalf, in his article Neoliberalism, Idea That Swallowed the World, described effects of capitalism on us and our culture as such. 30 years on, and it can fairly be said that Hayek's victory is unrivaled. We live in a paradise built by his big idea. The more closely the world can be made to resemble an ideal market governed only by perfect competition, the more law-like and scientific human behavior in aggregate becomes. 
Every day we, ourselves, as no one has to tell us anymore, strive to become more perfectly like scattered, discreet, anonymous buyers and sellers. And every day we treat the residual desire to be something more than a consumer as nostalgia or elitism. As the economy shapes our culture, people that we call millennials are now first modern generation to be faced with economic pessimism early in life. A lot of millennials who are raised in a sense of optimistic prosperity, an all-you-can-buy party, which lasted till about 2008. Once the economic frenzy was over, millennials had to face the realization that our future lives would consist of ever more exciting and diverse forms of economic insecurity. After that realization, we went into a collective existential crisis, which resulted, among other things, in the rise of emo subculture and public notion that millennials refused to grow up. And while I mostly talk about Western countries here, but there was a level of similar economic effect across the world, as the period between 80s and 2000s attributed to millennial youth years was a period of so-called long peace. This time was characterized by de-escalation of Cold War and nuclear conflict threats, the opening of global markets and rapid scientific and technological progress, as well as freedom of information access through early internet. This global trend, however, was broken by a wave of economic crises in the late 2000s, escalation of war in the Middle East, chain of conflicts in Ethiopia and Somalia, and failure of the global north to commit to climate action. And well, you know what happened after that. Gen Z, however, was born into a period of complete doom. They didn't have to face a turn from optimism to pessimism. Their youth years are characterized by a period of insane economic inequality, cycling financial crises, and ever-growing awareness of climate crisis. This unfiltered pessimism resulted in the birth of Gen Z doomer culture, their large reliance on absurdism and 30 levels of irony and cultural media that they produce. I expect that teenagers today will only continue deeper into the abyss of absurdity as AI apocalypse and returning threat of international nuclear war have now been added back to the menu. We literally gave the imposter a nuke bomb today in Among Us. I settled on two parameters that can be used to describe modern cultural movements in their relationship with the invisible hand of the market. Here we have consumer minimalism and consumer maximalism. Or does this movement embrace consumption or shuns it? For example, on one side we have millennial minimalism that promotes throwing out most of the things you own. And on the other side we have Disney adults, Otterheads and Marvel fans who embrace consumption to achieve their individual fulfillment. On the other scale we have capitalist realism and capitalist mysticism. On the mystical end, we have manifestation and dark enlightenment and those who try to rely on beliefs, folklore, religion and intuition to help them cope with challenges of late-stage capitalism. On the realistic side, we have movements like hustlers, realists and doomers who try to find their place in the system of neoliberal order as it is with all its flaws. I also use Mark Fisher's definition of capitalist realism. So let's start with the mother of all modern coping strategies. Let's talk about self-help. Self-help is all these trees. All this text classified as self-help as we know it comes from about 2800 years BCE and is called the Maxims of Tahotep. The Maxims of Tahotep was intended to provide life advice to those who could read it for rulers and clergy, because literacy was like 1%. It contains collection of great verses that can guide one for a more fulfilling career, such as, do not gossip in your neighborhood because people respect silence, or love your wife with passion. For ages since, we have sought a counsel and advice of others. We ask how to raise a child, how to become a proper housewife, and how to make stay hard for longer. If you wonder about the last question, then the answer, according to Greek medicine, is to wait for the peak heat of summer. Old self-help advice was meant for a limited group of physicians, rulers, and scholars. So self-help boom did not come over till about 19th century. The first example of what we can count as a modern self-help is the book titled Self-Help by Samuel Smiles. I mean, the man mastered his title game. Book was published in 1859 and was an absolute hit. It was selling like hotcakes right off the printing press. 
Samuel, unexpectedly to himself, opened the flooding gates of $38 billion industry. Main points of his work are echoed across self-help culture and industry to this day. He concluded that the change in the individual and society for the better lies not within any organization or group of people, but can only come from within oneself. Aside from providing life advice, Smiles was the first one to identify a profitable market for self-help ideas. His book was written and printed with the intent to be read by the average literate person of the time. Smiles proved that now, at the age of enlightenment, every free man could get advice from a random guy with shaky credentials. He was later able to capitalize on his success by publishing more self-help books, namely Character, Thrift, Duty, and Life and Labor. So he also started another tradition of self-help genre namely reprinting the same book with minor changes under the new title every time you need a little influx of cash. You would think that there is only that many books about waking up early and not beating your wife that you can reprint in 200 years. But the stream of self-help books, advice, and paid services is seemingly a never-ending mind for grifters. I wanted to start our today's exploration with self-help because its effect on our culture and modern subcultures is so prolific. Self-help is a cultural movement in itself, of course, with dozens of TikTokers, YouTubers, and paid seminars that center around optimizing your pathetic and inefficient existence. I rated self-help at the middle ground on consumerist drive and slightly tilted towards capitalist realism. Classic self-help advocates against greed, but is still largely endorsing consumerism. Classics of self-help are destined to help you navigate life's difficulties under capitalism. Self-help often rejects systematic problems in our society in favor of personal inability to become a correct type of human. The claim of self-help is that you too can overcome flaws in capitalism and social inequality with a dash of self-improvement. I'm talking here about Tony Robbins and such, Atomic Habits, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, How to Win Friends and Influence People, 48 Laws of Power, 12 Rules for Life, and other media forms that give you a standard advice on how to improve your life. Clean your room, wash your ass, and create a monthly budget. On YouTube, the same ideas are propagated by channels like The School of Life, or Big Think, or creators like Matt Davilia or Ali Abdal. These channels will talk about the development of good habits, retrospection, and finding fulfillment and balance in your life, which is a good thing. Rarely, though, do they question overarching systematic issues that create a need for endless self-optimization in the first place. This classic self-help content is beige, approachable, and watching self-help videos actually will make you feel like you're achieving something. Ultimately, classic self-help is not here to provide help or to change us, but it is here to make us feel better. It is a modernized version of bibliotherapy. Faced with a time of crisis and pessimism, we look for advice and help to relieve our condition. As economic and social pessimism settle, self-help movement is rising to alleviate our struggle. Self-help makes us feel understood, but it also redirects any external flaws of the world onto our inner selves. You're not just broke because of generational poverty, but because you are not financially literate. Your constant state of tiredness is not caused by dissociation from labor and community, but by poor scheduling, and so on. If only you wake up a little earlier, eat a little healthier, and journal daily, you too will be able to live a successful, fulfilling, and happy life, just like Mark does. Hey everyone, we are live from my backyard, where I am smoking a brisket and some ribs. I am... I'm making meats now, smoking these meats here. Cultural claims of self-help is that we cannot change the world, but we can always optimize ourselves to fit the world. But enough of self-help. Let's talk about capitalist realism. I placed realism in the middle between minimalism and maximalism, because it can go both ways. And obviously it's pretty high on realism bar. Capitalist realism is a viewpoint that claims some variation of two statements. 
One, capitalism is the best system that we can possibly have. And two, that associated negative effects of the unregulated markets, like growing inequality and degradation of social safety nets, are justified by the benefits that the capitalist system is providing. Cultural movements that lean into capitalist realism are often byproducts of 70s and 80s kids, who, like younger millennials, witnessed a cultural switch from optimism to pessimism. Since they were already adults when the attitude switched, their coping mechanisms are different. Realists would often praise personal development, education, and career, but not as the ways to become successful financially, but because they see that this is the only way for their offspring and themselves to survive in the world riddled by financial uncertainty. In the absence of communal safety nets, soccer moms and wine aunts work relentlessly to build individual nets for personal safety for their family and offsprings. Realists understand the negative aspects of neoliberalism, but do not advocate for systematic change. They believe that if you play your cards right, you won't have to worry about living on the street or feeding your family. And, well, whatever happens in the world outside of your cultural cluster is better ignored to prevent any discomfortable feelings. Now, capitalist realism is not really a subculture, because it is mainstream. It is a cultural default. Realism is something that we're used to so much that we don't even notice that both Marvel and new Star Wars franchises are soaked in the narrative of capitalist realism. We have mainstream series of movies and art that propagate the idea that world, sad as it is, doesn't need to be changed. A never-ending stream of superheroes that are willing to sacrifice anything to defend status quo. And, you know, if we accept that capitalism is really here and associated negative effects cannot be eliminated or changed, then why won't we just relax a little and enjoy the ride? In 2010, Marie Kondo, Japanese media personality and organizing consultant, published The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, The Japanese Guide to Decluttering and Organizing. Ten years later, during the pandemic, somewhere between baking sourdough bread and spreading anti-Semitic conspiracies, all of us were faced with a difficult question. Does this spark joy? If the economy is crashing every five years, it is a reasonable decision to shape your life around that reality and try to minimize your purchasing needs. The trick here is, of course, money. Ironically, if you want to comfortably downsize to minimalism as opposed to just going homeless, you need money, and quite a bit of it. Apple products, high-quality clothing, and stainless steel appliances found a solid market base among minimalists. Services of Con Mari, or reorganizational firm of Marie Kondo, cost about $100 per hour. Minimalism is surprisingly expensive for the movement that tries to reject consumerism. Some versions of minimalism encourage one to shrink the quantity of their belongings to a van truck. Living on the go also requires you to have a job that permits frequent travel, making van life an undesirable option for the majority of working people. On the opposite end of now mostly dead, minimalism, there is maximalism and consumer aesthetics. Zoomer subcultures from e-girls to ska girls, dark academia and other later cultural movements are defined by their aesthetics. Cultural effects of consumerism combined with short-format social media posts on platforms like TikTok, Twitter and Instagram shape the sense of group identity in teenagers. Modern subcultures are formed around curated online aesthetics. The desire to keep up with the latest hashtag is guiding consumer behavior and social media activism of the new generations. The type of makeup, clothing, tags, accessories, and curated color palettes become a form of identity. Sometimes music or other forms of art can be incorporated into the subculture, but often art can become a form of curated consumption in itself, like it happened with Corpse Husband's music, for example. There is an idea proposed by other creators online that online aesthetics killed the actual subculture. But I think this is just an effect consumption has on all cultural movements as a whole. No matter what you're trying to do, you are what you buy. Another subculture under the maximalist wing that I wanted to talk about is franchise fan bases. This is a group of subcultures that includes Disney adults, Potterheads, or Marvel fans, or even Minecraft kids. On the scale between minimalism and maximalism, there is a point where consumption becomes everything, where one's identity is completely merged with their purchased goods and services. 
And I may make it sound very one-sided, but both minimalism and maximalism are equally locked into neoliberal consumerist market. They are equally a subject to marketing and self-expression through consumption. If anything, maximalism feels more organic in the world of endless sales and purchases. And since we're in for the ride anyway, you might as well make a collection of plastic mini dolls your whole identity. I'm not gonna judge you. Minimalism is more of a paradox in this case rather than a rule, because an idea of non-consumption eventually circles back. Any anti-capitalist idea that exists within the capitalist world eventually becomes an aesthetic that is expressed through purchasing. Minimalist wallets, watches, and makeup are available on Amazon. And minimalism itself as a cultural phenomenon has been incorporated into everything, from fashion designs to company logos. Millennial minimalism is expressed by throwing out all of one's stuff into a landfill and buying a bunch of overpriced black t-shirts that will shrink after first ride in the dryer. And I may roast minimalism, but you should probably know that I do wear the same set of clothing to work every single day, even though I'm not really required to do so. But despite my disinterest in purchasing stuff, I was never really able to lean into minimalism, since one generally needs to have a particular lifestyle and level of wealth to achieve typical minimalist look, neither of which I have. Throwing out or giving away things that I rarely use is not something that I can financially afford to do, and that appears to be a common story. Movements adjacent to minimalism, such as van life, cottagecore, or off-grid living, can be fully subverted by the modern cultural landscape. Originally, these subcultures rejected the modern neoliberal order and obsession with consumption. Eventually, though, media produced by the members of minimalist subculture was turned into Mr. Beast-style competition for building the biggest and the most expensive van. Solitude and the attachment of rural life are repackaged and sold as luxury detox or exotic vacation packages. Speaking of luxury off-grid detox vacation, let's talk about what happens when we go a little further into surplus enjoyment. While the world is not keen towards a lot of the people, there are plenty who seem to enjoy themselves. People own luxury clothing, expensive cars, and vacation resorts with oversized entry planters. Don't you ever wish that a bottomless hole in the middle of your chest could simply be filled by a shiny new W16? So, do you want to find joy in consumption? If so, let's try hustle culture. Thank God it's Monday, baby. Rise and grind. Hustle culture both encourages maximalist consumption as is fairly realistic. Early ideas of capitalism were riding on the wave of liberal philosophy, on the idea that merit was the main criteria that made individuals succeed in a free market economy. Neoliberal thinkers theorized that free market is the absolute and the best equalizer. Such a romanticized version of capitalism is not reasonable for younger generations, because we have a pleasure to live in the world where one man owns more wealth than the whole economy of a small European country. So hustle culture gives us a different and more realistic promise. Hustlers confirm that simple merit is not enough to succeed. Now, not just hard work, but sweat, blood, and tears of the anointed are required to become a successful capital owner. Hustle culture creates a myth where meritocracy still exists, but in its most aggressive form. Hustle content is used to motivate viewers to continue the grind in the hope that waking up at 5 a.m working two low-paying jobs, or investing in Gary Vee's pyramid scheme will make them rich. And many choose to do so, because for our hopeful delusional brains, believing in the possibility of success is often more important than the success itself. Hustle culture also found its place in modern gender dynamics. Here, we have ladies and gentlemen that stem off the hustle culture in a form of girl-boss feminism and manosphere. Let's start with 35-year-old girls. Girl Boss Movement found its cozy spot in late 2010s and asked a very important question. What if we place women in the position of oppressor? Would that help? Girl Boss Feminism is ultimately a flawed idea, but nonetheless, it became quite popular in the younger generation of women who were entering the workforce and trying to secure a salary big enough to scare the whole manosphere. 
While the promise of capitalist success still carries from hustle culture to girl boss culture, most girl boss influencers are pretty open about the challenges and difficulties femmes face in the workplace. They just come to a very different conclusion in regards to solutions to workplace inequality. Sheryl Sandberg, who is typically associated with girl boss feminism, sure has occasional tone deaf advice. But she is also pretty open about the fact that women need to work harder and be more strategic if they decide to climb corporate ladder. And she is pretty good in giving practical advice of navigating workplace that can be hostile to women. Which is, in the words of the worst possible dating guru that you can get, Steve Harvey, act like a lady, think like a man. Girl boss movement suggests that women fight inequality as isolated individuals rather than the organized groups. A woman who can pull herself up by her own bootstraps can then position herself comfortably in the hierarchy and free herself of the majority of patriarchal struggle by the means of cold hard cash. Girl boss movement is a monetary based alternative to feminism, an attempt to buy liberation. The same alternative can be proposed to visible minorities and queer people by the means of black or rainbow capitalism. People like Jeffree Star, RuPaul, or Caitlyn Jenner are free to express themselves as they please, with far fewer risks than queer people of lower financial status. In a way, just as girl bosses, they are able to buy a liberation for one while the rest of the queer people can purchase their own liberation by buying rainbow-colored mayonnaise. New liberal economy holds its promise of equality for sale. One can alleviate their own marginalized status by holding enough cash, but such liberation remains purely individual and also incomplete. In reference to entertainment media, money is what turns a paralyzed black veteran into a war machine. But let us look about hustle culture, because this is where we start touching mystical capitalism. And we're gonna start light with Manosphere. Alarm! Alarm! Somebody call 911! Masculinity is in crisis! Money can certainly help alleviate the horrible prospect of being a man in a late-stage capitalism. In a world that measures man's worth based on the value of his property and size of his Wallet, being poor is not just erasing personhood out of one's life, it is also erasing manhood out of a man. Neoliberal obsession with individualism promises to make every boy a superhero, but in reality creates lone warriors destined to face loneliness, failure and defeat entirely on their own. Men with their souls and egos fractured by the culture that is indifferent to their struggle are left vulnerable to scams that promise to restore their well-being, their masculinity and their social status. Manosphere gurus then promise men a mystical future world, where their dreams of status and wealth are fulfilled. The means of achieving this mystical state of restored masculinity can be quite different. More aggressive figures like Andrew Tate promise men that they can restore their souls by accumulating enough wealth to purchase any material or sexual desires. Fresh and Fit suggest you achieve inner peace by never forming a committed relationship with a woman, while Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson suggest that you achieve the same exact inner peace by doing the exact opposite, by forming a traditional family unit with extreme level of commitment. Red pills, black pills, white pills. The diagnosis of men's condition varies across the manosphere, so does the suggested treatment. But one thing remains constant. Men are promised that they can alleviate their never-ending existential pain on their own by the means of obtaining enough wealth and status to be their own masters. In some way, manosphere promises the same hope to men as girl boss feminism promises to women ability to purchase independence and happiness. Men are promised a dream, a myth, that if they start gambling money on day trading and stop spending money on women and stop jerking for 30 days and buy yet another self-help course from yet another manfluencer, they will finally feel whole again. The main distinguishing characteristic of modern cultural movement is endless optimization of one's performance and looks. Since we are detached from the environment, work, and other people, numbers and items are treated as marks of kinship and success. 
rush for better numbers, whatever those numbers indicate, is especially prominent. Everything from your daily steps and calories to your bank account to your body count needs to be constantly tracked and measured. And perhaps more importantly, those numbers better be f***ing growing. Productivity fetishism is at the center of public ideology and as a result penetrates cultural movements. We expect endless and uninterrupted positive growth, not just from GDP, but from ourselves. For those who don't want to make numbers their whole identity, there is an alternative route to reject modernity. Doomerism and collapse core are relatively new developments in the culture and are a direct result of negative economic and cultural outlook of 21st century thus far. Doomers are a reaction to the world on fire. It is an exhausted apathy of modern teenagers, raised on a saturated mixture of clickbait titles and TikToks of war crimes. This is a full case of Kinderegg. Doomerism is a side effect of capitalist realism. It is pure, distilled pessimism combined with a hope for alternative future. Some will accept doom as a form of adaptation to or rebellion against the capitalist system. I personally see doom as a path to action, a simmering state of collective mind which, aside from making fascism popular again, can result in creation of more original, new and sustainable ideas. Doom radicalizes. It produces activists, thinkers and revolutionaries, but it also produces reactionary movements. Both accelerationism and dark enlightenment inform a lot of internet doomerism. Both also draw a personal mystical world that can happen as a logical progression of late-stage capitalism and increasing militarization. Dark enlightenment is not really a subculture on its own yet, Nonetheless, it already found its bay in tech pro culture, tech billionaires and sympathetic peasants who defend Elon Musk on Twitter. This is somewhat of an apocalyptic call to the claims that eventually our tech advancements and unregulated market are destined to produce a birth of a new, superior form of intelligence. The fact that both humans and the environment will be eradicated post-singularity is viewed as a good thing, as a natural progression. After all, all the important people have post-apocalyptic bunkers, and whatever happens to you is not really a concern for those who slap assault rifles on AI-powered drone hives. Accelerationism and dark enlightenment are developing cultural movements with strong potential to influence mainstream politics and culture of 21st century in the same way that fascism framed the cultural development of mid-20th century. And just as fascism did in the 20th century, dark enlightenment also relies on the idea of mystical prosperous future for selected few that can be built on bloodshed and struggle in the present. Adepts of dark enlightenment, similar to doomsday preppers, dream that they will survive the technocratic apocalypse by uploading their intelligence into the net, and that they will enjoy the futuristic world where their bodies and minds are augmented with technology. Despite the obvious problem that most of those people would not be able to afford such transfer, even if such technology did exist. Meanwhile, all of the ideas of dark enlightenment do nothing but justify an action against neoliberal order by claiming that we should just wait till we die and everything will certainly be good. This sure doesn't remind me of any other mechanisms that we use to cope with low social security. But not all the roads lead to dark enlightenment, and some adepts of mystical capitalism will try to imagine their own little worlds within the existing one. Off-grid is more of a middle ground between realism and mysticism. A lot of people choose to go into solitude and off-grid living because they understand that they can't find a place in the modern world and that there is no alternative. Dread life overlaps with off-grid living, but is more on the mystical side as it is predicated on a belief that you will be able to alleviate the cave community by role-playing with your wife. But no matter how traditionalists thrive, unless they grow cocaine on their farmstead, their lifestyle goes against the realities of late capitalism and thus is very volatile. Even if one can afford to support family on a single income and their wife embraces the role of a housewife in some severely redacted version of 50s nuclear family, there is no guarantee that their dream will come true. 
In case such traditional family unit faces financial challenges like loss of income, sudden unemployment, or disability, role-playing a 50s rom-com can quickly turn into role-playing a Great Depression drama. Sometimes it is noted by conservative and religious groups that it is progressive ideologies or lack of faith that killed family. But really, did it? Or did the traditional family institution simply become yet another communal unit destined to be destroyed by the idea of radical individualism? Oh well, that's a story for another day. In traditional living scenario, off-grid or rural living proposes a play where one is allowed to pretend to be in a parallel world. Often traditional living models social structures that predate neoliberalism. So, before we get our hands dirty in the blood of sacrifices to the gods of prosperity, let us discuss capitalist attraction to mysticism. One way to deal with the problems of the world is to embrace reality. And to extend, most subcultures do so. Realism, though, is quite painful. My assertion is such that you have to have some suppressed masochist kink if you choose to embrace reality, because just f***ing look at it. This behind me is HMP Foss Way, and it's maybe the most technologically advanced prison in the world. So instead we imagine that the world of prosperity and freedom is located in the distant past, or the future, or the fantasy land, and try to get there by performing rituals. In current economy, you are required to work to maintain even the most basic standard of living. Unless your parents own an oil well or sell guns, I guess. The prospect of dying from old age at the Walmart till does not sound exciting. Thankfully, though, our minds are equipped with the ability to create myths, dreams, and multi-level marketing schemes to cope with negativity in our life. Kamarovs describe capitalist mysticism as such in their essay Millennial Capitalism – First Thoughts on Second Coming. Capitalist mystical tendencies have a single common denominator – the allure of occurring wealth from nothing. In this respect, they are born of the same animating spirit as casino capitalism. Indeed, perhaps they are casino capitalism for those who lack fiscal and cultural capital, or who, for one reason or another, are reluctant to gamble on more conventional markets, like traditional investing. Like alchemist cunning that promises to turn straw into gold, this new alchemist techniques defy reason by promising unnaturally large profits. They promise to yield wealth without production, to produce value without effort. Ultimately, all mystical movements propose disproportional return on investment, be it wealth or personal fulfillment, and the deeper you go, the bigger the promised treasure. Manosphere doesn't just build a myth of restored manhood, but also relies on promotion of pyramid schemes and crypto investing as the promise of a luxury life. QAnon and adjacent conspiracies proposed investment in things like gold bars or Photoshop pictures of an old man covered in spray tan as the means of producing wealth. So with that outlook, let's explore the uncharted ocean of mystical capitalism. While one can slide into mystical thinking through manosphere and trad life movements, the most conventional gate to the underground is actually wellness. Wellness movement in the West is fairly old. Smarter traders figured really early on that they can just pick the most random practice or ingredient that white men considered to be foreign and exotic and sell it for a shit ton of money. But modern wellness movement traces back to 50s and 60s and most recently peaked in 2010s. Seems that in the period between the Second and Third World Wars, we are increasingly preoccupied with drinking liquefied vegetables to improve quality and length of our pathetic lives. At the times when medicine is inaccessible to many and state of sickness is defined purely by one's inability to work, wellness, natural and alternative remedies become an important part of how we care for ourselves. Wellness culture as we know it today, however, may become very, very interesting, and goes from drinking spinach smoothies to treating cancer with crystals in less than three hyperlinks. Wellness gurus and products promise that adepts of the culture can alleviate their stress, anxiety, and disease by taking part in particular activities, rituals, and consumer behaviors. I also really wanted to go on a tangent here about wellness movement obsession with horoscopes and fortune telling. In the world of endless possibilities, we are flooded with endless choices of how to live our life. 
So many find comfort in fictional yet more limited fate. Modern astrology as well as other forms of fortune telling often concentrate on narrowing one's choices so that we're not faced with a choice paralysis. After all, millennials can get their own Harry Potter sorting hat fix by going to tarot reader who will finally sort them into their position in a society. Here, it says that you're about to receive a good fortune really soon if you like this video. So, wellness once again concentrates on individuals inspecting themselves as a source of all ill, rather than on raising larger questions about personal surroundings. You can go to yoga classes three times a week to alleviate workplace stress, but not ask why seemingly harmless activity of pushing papers for eight hours each single day can cause you so much stress that you need a $150 yoga studio membership. May it be the fact that most of the people live paycheck to paycheck? Oh, don't worry about those questions. Here, here, take this bracelet. It is good for absorbing those negative thoughts. Wellness culture redirects issues in one's well-being and, perhaps most importantly, one's productivity to mystical entities such as bad energies, generational curses, and misaligned chakras. Wellness culture then proposes group experiences and products that are meant to alleviate individual struggles and sometimes even provide a person with a sense of community and belonging through group retreats, brand loyalty, and cults. For those who yet fail to achieve cultural fulfillment through the use of scented oils and in aggressively shaped sex toys, even deeper mystical alternatives are available. Abundance mindset and manifestation culture gain a significant level of popularity in latest years and, I suppose, will continue to accumulate more followers. Yours truly has an old classmate who leads courses on manifestation, so I was even granted a discounted course. And, well, because I like all things weird, sure thing I did it. So now I guess I can overanalyze manifestation movement with some level of expertise. Just like with wellness, there is a significant range on how manifestation subculture engages with the idea of prosperity. Or, to be more specific, idea of capital ownership. What I had pleasure to learn was a less mystical approach. In a nutshell, the universe can fulfill your wishes under a particular set of conditions. One, you want a thing. Two, you work towards the thing that you want. Three, you maintain a good level of energy and a positive outlook. Overall, my experience taking this course was pretty positive. It had a significant level of weirdness, but I also finally learned to meditate. Having a mentor in a group with whom you can hang out is always a nice thing to have, even if I had to pay for it. That's kind of is the whole economic model of wellness movement, after all. And well, really, if you maintain an optimistic outlook on life, you have a set of reasonable life goals and you work towards them as taught by the base level manifestation movements, there is a decent chance that you can succeed in achieving your goals. That's just 12 rules for life, but less misogyny and we're also meditating with scented candles. Abundance mindset and manifestation, however, just as wellness movement, go far beyond aromatherapy and vision boards. More radical teachings promise that manifestation can achieve a miracle, attract wealth, cure disease, or restore relationship without performing any actions, acquire wealth without labor. For those who ever had an interest in phenomenon of megachurches and prosperity gospel, this may sound familiar. Manifestation is the ultimate form, the final boss of capitalist mysticism. Manifestation gurus often refer to the term universe as a more secular entity to direct your prayers. However, using God is still considered appropriate. The universe, or God in this case, is the capitalist system itself, an all-powerful and inevitable entity that gives out resources to those who are worthy and denies resources to those who are not. This is also consistent with the concept of sin found in manifestation movements as those who fail to manifest prosperity in their own life ought to explain this failure with their own individual internal flaws. So, for example, mental blocks, lack of belief, or I guess desire in this case, detachment from good energies, laziness, and such are viewed as factors that would prevent manifestation from coming into reality. 
In the worst cases, when everything fails, manifestation advisors conclude the universe safeguards believers from obtaining manifested goods if those would harm the believer or if they would not be able to manage them. Manifestation serves the same purpose for secular use that the religion does for religious people of older generations. But instead of Sunday church, we're doing an eagle pose and we meditate with abundance mantras instead of prayers. Manifestation maintains neoliberal optics of individual merit. While the capitalist system claims the poor to be unskilled or lazy, manifestation claims the poor as vessels of bad energy and as those who fail to manifest a good life. But what if Manifestation doesn't cut it for you. Well then, luckily for you, my friend, there is still an alternative. I am a very big fan of conspiracies. Modern humans are capable of flying to space, smashing atoms and killing each other in so many creative ways. But we are also capable of believing that the Earth is a hollow donut populated by satanic Jewish aliens. Isn't it fascinating? My first experience with conspiracy was 1988 theory that the Black Sea is going to explode into thousands due to sulfur accumulation, and that would create an environmental catastrophe. I found the booklet in a trash pile in the library, which kind of summarizes some of my reading habits. What the author of the booklet didn't know, of course, is that we do not need to explode the Black Sea to create an environmental catastrophe. Conspiracies are believed to be a byproduct of our brain, as we are very good in building intuitive connections. Sometimes our brains just come to a conclusion that furniture is so expensive because it includes child slaves, and not because the sale of overpriced goods is associated with high status. Spreading conspiracy theories was always a popular way to spend a cozy evening with your family and friends, but with access to limitless and unfiltered pool of information through the internet, this hobby seems to be back in trance. There are a lot of conspiracies today. A lot of them are very harmful. Some of them lead to social unrest, murder, and actual genocide. Internet allows us access to limitless knowledge, and we understand now that truth is not the limit either. And I'm not going to go in depth on any specific conspiracies here. Rather, I wanted to highlight a common idea that traces through almost all of the modern conspiracies. The old ones, too. No matter if you take QAnon, COVID conspiracies, modern flatters, 9-11, anti-Semitism, or denial of school shootings, there is one very prominent idea, that there is a form of secret, or if you want, deep state or organization that is controlling the world. Conspiracy is unknown to produce a sense of belonging, a feeling that one is a part of a group that possesses a secret, deep knowledge, a sense of belonging that is otherwise hard to obtain in neoliberal world. Suppose special knowledge gives believers a sense of power and control over the wealthy monsters, in a world where they lack economic means to control as little, is their own lives. There are many elements to conspiratorial thinking that attract all sorts of personalities, but all of the conspiracies provide two things for the people who join associated movements. Conspiracies allow its members to construct an alternative reality, where their ability to hold power is not limited by the lack of personal capital. Conspiracy provides a version of a mythical utopian alternative world, the world that can be built through violence against the members of a deep state or other enemy group. In old folklore, vampires ought to be killed with fire. In modern folklore, they need to be imprisoned, hanged, or otherwise eradicated. This, of course, makes people who join conspiracies also susceptible to reactionary nationalist and fascist ideologies. Hard right relies on the idea of a secret and powerful outsider group, subverting the idea of a deep state in a claim that particular group that is just as poor has a secret power over our reality. Ideas of fascist conspiracies fit well with anyone who already accepted the notion that there is a secret invisible billionaire billions behind the uh, well-known billionaire billions. Nonetheless, many people choose to cope with the stress and disadvantage of their life with conspiracies. What if you are the warrior of light and reason who is going to slay monsters and build an all-white utopian paradise any day now? That's far more exciting than the reality where modern conspiracy nuts are just regular folk that have to endlessly work for pennies while getting progressively more detached from the people around them. Overall, 
all subcultures of the modern day attempt to reclaim a sense of belonging. A sense of belonging that a lot of younger folk never really experienced in the first place. In all of us, there is a hole that cannot be filled by consumption, no matter how much money one can afford to spend. Consumption for the sake of consumption seems to deepen our pessimism as our connections to brands, celebrities and items replace human connections. Younger people are facing rise in mental and general health issues as kaleidoscope of human experience gets confined into Smithsonian human nature. So really, while I'll certainly consider many of the subcultures harmful, elements of some of the subcultures are harmless. And if you think that scented candles or camping make you happier and more fulfilled, don't let anyone stop you from doing the things that you enjoy. I wanted to wrap us up with the last subcultural cluster that is relatively young. Slow living is an arising cultural movement. Slow living takes elements from cottagecore, minimalism, wellness and traditional living, and in its current form has not been yet co-opted by commodity market. It's on the way though, don't you worry. Slow living proposes to revolutionize the way one is engaging with capitalism. Capitalist consumption and individualism are still there, but they serve the purpose of fulfilling one's needs, not as the way to construct one's identity. The culture of the slow living concentrates on the beauty of the surrounding world, on pleasure found in small, unimportant and mundane, in building fulfilling connections with people and taking life easy overall. Slow living can still turn into another consumer aesthetic, or it can just go down another dark hole of the wellness culture. But in the moment, this is one of the cultural movements that are interested in actively questioning a narrative of individualism over consumption and an endless rush to the top of productivity and peak performance. As time progresses, new waves of cultural movements and interests will come and go in an attempt to build something more human in the inhuman world that we build for ourselves. So, certainly, a list of cultural movements that I highlighted today is very limited, and if you feel like I missed out on some big modern subcultural clusters or maybe classified something wrong, you can always let me know in the comments. Like, where does the water talk fit in this chart? Let's make a stinking water of the day. I hope you like this video as I wanted to do something more lighthearted before I start working on more specific videos for the year and subscribe so we see each other on the next one.